Happy Sunday, church. Hello. Um, we miss you all. And um, yeah, before we go into a time of worship, uh, let's open in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this week. Um, even, even if some of us may be going through a time of um, maybe a, a lack of motivation or frustration or stress, um, no work or even more work, um, and maybe even loneliness, Lord, we pray uh, that as we sing these songs, we may be reminded of your goodness, of your closeness to us, Lord, of your faithfulness and your love for us. Um, and also, Lord, um, as, as we sing your praises and as we give glory to you, uh, may that bring refreshing to our souls and to our hearts. Um, so we thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you that we get to still gather in this way and give you glory in this way, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
worship uh, and as we go into the rest of this uh, service would you go before us uh, with the Holy Spirit open up our hearts uh, to hear what you have to say and God would we be doers of your word um, and not just hearers Lord uh, so Lord, we thank you again for this Sunday um, in Jesus name I pray Hi everyone welcome to the home church's Sunday service we are glad to have you here for the children watching this at home, you may be dismissed if your parents tell you. And for the rest of us, let's take the next few minutes to greet one another and welcome each other. Um, so yeah, take the next few minutes to text or message or send emojis to one another. You can wave hi or do a hug emoji. And if you're new here, uh, don't be shy and say hi as well. We'd love to welcome you. I Happy Sunday, everybody. Um, our first announcement today is on behalf of the finance team, they would like to thank everyone for your willingness and accommodations during this time to give through these mobile platforms. Um, however, going forward, the finance team has decided that the home church will no longer cover the processing fee that is charged for every mobile transaction. Um, however, there is an added feature where if you are willing and able to account for this processing fee, it can be automatically added on to your giving amount. Any questions or concerns, please contact the finance team at thehomechurchfinance at gmail.com. Next, we have our church membership class coming up this Saturday um, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Zoom. And so if you're interested in becoming a covenanted member of the home church, or if you want to learn more about what that means, go ahead and 
um, sign up through our website under the Bible study classes tab and um, church membership class. And the last day to sign up is this coming Wednesday. Our next announcement is our virtual communities are still taking place and available for anyone to join. Um, virtual communities is a place for people to engage in fellowship with one another and to have fun online around a common interest. And so here are the ones that we have available right now. Um, if you are interested in joining one of these, go onto our website um, under the virtual communities tab and all of um, the VC leaders emails should be there and you can contact them and they will get you plugged in. And then if you are a covenant member, um, you have the opportunity to create one of your own by filling out a Google form also found on the website um, where it will be sent to Chad and then he will be in communication with you moving forward. And so all questions can be referred to Chad at chadespinoza88 at gmail.com. Our next announcement is our monthly ask meeting is coming up next Sunday um, following the service. And so if you're not a Christian or if you're not sure if you're a Christian, please sign up for this meeting. Pastor Mitchell would love to have a conversation with you. And if all covenant members could be in prayer for VIPs to attend this meeting. And um, despite the limitations and possible hindrances during this time. And next, Pastor Mitchell is going to share our last announcement for this coming for this Sunday. Thank you. Bye. Well, THC, you know that next Sunday is the first Sunday of the month, which means that it's communion. And communion is an important sacrament. It's an important way that we experience our faith in Jesus Christ, but in a very tangible, physical way. Um, in communion, we're remembering the cost of our salvation. We're inviting Christ to examine our heart, our current spiritual state. Um, and it's a time for honest reflection. It's a time of repentance and commitment to God and really anchoring our heart in the truth of the gospel. Um, listen, we will continue to practice the monthly rhythm of, of participating in communion as a church community, um, even during this quarantine time. But it's going to look different, obviously, right? So here's what I'm asking you guys to do. Um, next Sunday, before church even begins, I want you to prepare a small piece of bread, or it could be a, a tortilla, it could be a cracker, um, a small piece, and then also um, a juice, or it could be water or tea in small portion. And we want something simple. We don't want an extravagant um, meal. Uh, it's just going to be a small portion of a simple um, snack. And the reason for this is um, we, I, I want to encourage a greater focus and time on reflection than chewing and eating. Okay. And um, I want to encourage you to do this before church begins. Have it close by wherever you are sitting to watch the service so that when we transition into that time, you don't have to, you know, head off to the kitchen and uh, prepare it right there and then. So have it, have it done before, before service begins, and then also have it close by. And um, I want to encourage you that before service begins, as you're preparing that physical food, even if it takes like 10 seconds to do it, right? Um, as you're preparing the physical food, prepare your spiritual heart, your mind, and your will um, and begin to focus on God um, as an act of worship. Begin to prepare your hearts to receive truth. Begin to prepare your heart to sing to a worthy God. And prepare your, your ears to listen intently to the testimony that will be going on. And at the end of the message, we will have communion. I'll have some instructions for you. And there will be an extended time um, that we will include in the service where we will reflect together as a community from our separate homes, obviously. And so I just want to thank you for making these adjustments as we look to continue to honor Christ the best we can, considering the times that we live in. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elena Perez, and I am Pastor Mitchell's wife. Mitchell and I got married in 2010 at the ages of 20 and 22. You guys, that's nine and a half years. We have three beautiful children. Isabel is the oldest. She's eight years old. 
Isaiah is our middle child. He is six years old. And then there's our little bundle of terror, Judah. He is one year old. I was asked to talk about the challenges and blessings that come with raising children at THC. Pastor Mitchell asked me to share on this topic because he seems to think that in a blink of an eye, there will be plenty more kids being embraced at THC. As we encounter more children, it is important for us to remember that these little ones are VIPs and our role as members of THC is to embrace them, pray for them, and hopefully one day be a part of leading them to Christ. Obviously, things have changed with quarantine, but before all of the coronavirus stuff happened, I would have said that it was hard for me to prioritize church community outside of Sunday service or family church. It is the after hours when people want to conversate or go to dinner that is hard. It is hard for me to not feel as if my kids or I am a burden to others when I cannot go through a conversation with undivided attention. Going to church and serving in church has not been a struggle for me as a mom. I am not sure if this is because of the love I have for serving or if it's because I basically became a wife to a pastor and became a mom all at once, but I genuinely love being involved in ministry. Actually, now that I think about it, even with quarantine, I still struggle with church community outside of church. I constantly want to do more, but feel like I'm not capable of more. I do what I can to serve the church, but I have at times resented being a mom. To clarify, I do not resent my children or being their mom. The thing that I can come become resentful towards is seeing being a mom as a ministry. Honestly, being a mom can be one of the most rewarding jobs, but it also can be one of the toughest. I do my best to raise our kids to be respectful, kind, and to be appreciative, but there are times when it feels like nothing I do is taking root. There have been many seasons of struggle within my heart because I feel like serving in a ministry at church would be more effective than sitting in the baby room with Judah. The part that I need to be honest about is that I am pretty sure that the only reason I would rather serve outside of my kids as a ministry is because then I would get some type of recognition, recognition and gratitude for my service. That is where I have been wrong and will probably continue to be wrong at times. The reason that this is a wrong attitude is because I know that service to Christ should come out of my understanding of Christ's love for me. Christ loved and served me without condition and knowing that I had nothing to give in return. And in return, his grace and love for me is something that I as a Christian am called to give others. I am called to be an extension of his love for his people, which means that I am to do my best with his help to love and serve unconditionally. I am not called to serve or love out of selfish ambition. If that is why I am stepping into a serving role, then I am not being an, an example or extension of Christ that I am called to be. Will I always do this and do it perfectly again? I don't think so. But the more important thing is that I recognize it and use it as an opportunity to grow in my love and service to Christ. Another challenge I have had raising my kids at THC is that our children's ministry has anywhere between one to 18 kids at times. The times when there are one to two kids, it has oftentimes, if not every time, been our kids. In some ways, it would be easier to take our kids to a church with a larger children's ministry where they could start to build community with kids their age. A church where these lifelong friendships can be fostered. There have been more conversations with my kids than I would like to admit of them wanting and praying for friends and cousins to come to church with them and to share this part of their lives with. But even though that is a sacrifice that we make and indirectly ask our kids to make, we do not mind making that choice because we are making this sacrifice for the glory of God because the children we have allow us the ability to reach families with children for the gospel. Now, one thing I want to make clear before I move on is that just because I call it a sacrifice, I do not view this as a negative thing. What I consider sacrifice is simply his mighty power at work within us 
to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Ephesians 3.20 Hopefully the things I have shared do not sound too challenging or sad because there is a lot of good that comes with raising our kids at THC. One benefit of having a children's ministry our size is that the adults at church know the kids. Our kids are so loved and spoiled with attention in a way that I do not think most kids are at church. Our kids have received so many gifts from THC members who have traveled abroad, gifts from guest speakers, birthdays, retreats, holidays, and random gifts from people who see something that simply reminds them of the kids. The kids have also received surprise birthday parties from Hannah and our college boys, Howard, Josh, Paul, Aiden, and Jesse. Letters of encouragement from people like Joanne, Kristen, and Rachel, and best friends who are full of wisdom and are great examples of what it is to love and serve Christ. One of the bigger things that I have personally loved is that through Family Church, our kids have learned what it is to serve the church. Our kids have this excitement on Fridays, mostly before quarantine, that is infectious. They love helping set up the table. They love helping clean the house. Shocker, right? And they love seeing, they love serving RFC members. Belle is the one who will write out our agenda and write every person's name on a cup. Isaiah loves to say hello, eating last. I don't know how he enjoys that so much and walking people to their cars with his dad. I have seen my kids grow more than I thought possible in such a short amount of time. This is not to say that there is no struggle at times, but our kids genuinely enjoy seeing our gu your guys' faces, even if they don't know how to show it. The advice that I would want to leave current and future parents of THC is to remember that serving our kids is your first ministry or your most important act of service to God and learn to love it. Remember that all the small things add up and become big things. As I say this, I am reminded of Jen's testimony. If you haven't heard his testimony, you should go back to last week's message and listen to it. He shared about how Christianity was so embedded in his identity at an early age that even when he tried to walk away from Christ, he could not really get too far into the world. If I as a parent believe that two plus two is four and that that is a fact, then I'm going to teach my children that truth. In the same way, if I believe that Christ is real and his word is truth, I am going to teach my kids just that. I have heard some Christian parents say that they are going to let their children choose what they will believe and not raise them to believe what they have chosen, which is Christianity. But in my opinion, all that will do is show them that you as a parent do not even believe what you say you believe, that your truth was not actual truth or you would have taught them those truths. There have been and will be many opportunities to preach the gospel to your children. Take advantage of them. When they are treated unkindly by other children, teach them to respond with kindness because God has treated us kindly when we didn't deserve it through the cross. When your kids are afraid, remind them that we believe in a God who has created all things and is bigger than those fears. Tell them what David says in Psalms 27, 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I am not always good at this, but when the kids do something that is wrong, I do my best to have a conversation with them about what they did in light of who God is and who he calls us to be. With that, where I have made mistakes, I try to remember to ask them for forgiveness and remind them that I too am a sinner and I have growing to do, just as they do. I have given them permission to tell me that I am yelling, and I tell them to ask me to count to three or not to use my angry voice instead of continuing on with my rant. Allow your kids to hold you accountable. Show your kids what grace and love looks like. It has taken me years to try and figure out how to deal with my anger and give my problems to God. I have gotten better, but I still fall short so often. When I remember this and think of how gracious God has been with me, I'm patient enough to gently show me this reality over and over again. How can I not be gracious to my kids? The oldest is eight. In those eight years, she has learned how to walk, talk, read, write, speak a language, be respectful, have manners, and she is also learning what the gospel is 
and what it means to her. When I try to wrap my mind around this, how could I not be gracious? Well, it's easy for me to not be gracious because I am forgetful, but that's not the point. The point of this was to say that sometimes being gracious means giving them dessert even though they did not finish their food. Give them another chance and then another when they are full of attitude. Because how many times do we give the Lord attitude and choose to do what we want and yet he remains gracious to us? Show your kids that even though there are consequences to their actions, that there is still love for them. Show your kids that ministry to them is important even when serving doesn't necessarily involve them. If we say to ourselves and to our kids that Christ is the most important person to us, then we need to show them that we mean what we say because kids are good at calling out our lies. Kids are smart and they pay attention to the things we say and do. Sometimes that means sacrificing the things we want for our kids, for our families and for ourselves so that we can be obedient to the call that the Lord has placed on our lives. To end, in my opinion, the best way you guys can help moms or parents in general here at THC is simply continue to serve and love our kids. The most practical way you can do that is through your FC. I know right now it's a lot harder to do that since we are not meeting in person, but when we do, do your best to show them that they are loved and valued. Show them that they are just as important to THC as you are. Examples that our FC has done in the past is we have Lauren who loves using her Cricut to make birthday banners and cards. We have Crystal who is always ready with a gift for the kids, whether it's Valentine's Day, a birthday, Easter, or she just saw a character toy that one of the kids has mentioned before. We have Paul, Danny, and Pastor John who love to be silly with the kids. On a more current note, because of hashtag social distancing, the best thing you can currently do is check in on the moms and dads at church. We are going nuts having these kids 24 seven. We too enjoy a message every now and then, asking how our day is going. We too need community if we don't always have time, for, even if we don't always have time for it. I am sure it can be frustrating to ask a mom or dad to hang out, talk or text when their response is often that they cannot but it is also discouraging to us when we cannot do those things and look forward to the day that we can, but people have stopped reaching out. We too cherish friendship, your friendship, but it sometimes looks different for us. And we look forward to the day when we have a little more time and space to let you in. In closing, what a privilege and blessing that God has given THC, these children to preach and model the gospel to. Let's all work together so we can see God do a work in our children's heart and for many generations to come. All right, guys. Well, thank you, Lena, for that really good, good testimony. And I think it's just a good reminder for all of us that, um, and right now it may seem like uh, kids are not that vital of a part of what we're doing, but the truth is, is man, we got a, we got a bunch of young kids and as our church continues to grow, I hope that we also grow with having kids ourselves and reaching people who have kids. So thank you for that testimony, Lena. Let's go ahead and extend a hand towards her and uh, lift her up to you. Lift her up to the Lord today. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for Elena, my wife. And uh, God, I thank you for our kids um, all 18 of them that Mama Delia oversees in our children's ministry. And um, Lord, each one of them, a special gift from you. And I just pray, God, that you would give us just wisdom, grace, strength um, to steward these 18 souls well and any more that you bring our way. And as they're brought into our family churches and our Sunday worship services, may we just be intentional to share the gospel with them, to model the gospel to them and do a great thing, God. And so we lift her up to you today in Jesus name. Amen. Hello, my name is Kelly Cow, and I am a shepherd in the Alaska Family Church. This Sunday's passage is Acts eleven nineteen through 12, 25. 
but I'm only going to read Acts chapter 11, verse 19 through chapter 12, verse 5. Pastor Mitchell asks to either pause the video now or read the whole passage after the sermon is over. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. A great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them to all remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for us all. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. So the disciples determined every one according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made by God, made to God by the church. This is God's word for us today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we still get to join one another through virtual service and fellowship. We pray for strength, guidance, and clarity for Pastor Mitchell as he continues to preach virtually each Sunday. I pray that throughout each service, would you posture our hearts to be attentive and rid us of any distractions. God, I pray that the accessibility of this online service would be utilized to reach more unbelievers. Please open their hearts to receive your word and grace, and please open our hearts as well. We thank you and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. One. Well, thank you, Kelly Cow, for that prayer. And what's up, guys? Go ahead and Hulk smash that like button. Comment in the chat. Subscribe to our channel. No, no, no. We're not going to start church like that. Okay, but man, I just miss you guys. Um, I'm going crazy just looking at the back of my iPhone right now to record this message. I want to see your faces, you know? I want I to... Want, I I can't wait to be back in church with you guys. Um, but with that being said, if you are new to our church, welcome. Please say hi in the chat. Would love to connect with you more deeply and, um, and welcome. Okay, well, let's go ahead and dive into today's passage. The, the title of today's message is The Mystery of the Mission. And we're continuing our sermon series through the book of Acts. And Acts is the story of the early church movement. And my desire as we go through the book of Acts is not just that you learn history, okay, about the early church, though that is important, but it's also to allow our hearts to be captured by the beauty of the early church. Um, think about it this way. If, if there was one group of men and women, um, Christians, that we today should seek to emulate and that we should view as our models and examples um, of what Christian community should look like and what the purpose of the church should be, shouldn't we look at the men that Jesus specifically chose and trained for three years, the apostles? 
Um, shouldn't we look at the men that Jesus gave that apostle authority to? Um, these are the men that led and built the foundation of the Christian church. So that's been my heart as your pastor as we go through the book of Acts. It's not just to study the book of Acts, right? But, but really that our hearts would be aligned with the purpose, the mission, the heart, the spirit of the New Testament church. Amen? Say amen. Say amen. Jason Chen, say amen. I know you did it. Say it now. Okay, now I got you. Um, okay, I'm going to tackle this passage the same way that I tackled last week's passage. I wanna explain um, most of the large section uh, so that we can have a basic understanding of what's happening in this unfolding story of the early church. And then I want to point out a few lessons that we THC peeps should take note of and seek to apply in our own life. So let's go ahead and return to Acts chapter 11 to, um, to the part that, that Kelly Cow read for us just right now. And um, I want you to remember also that you know, Luke, who's the author of the book of Acts, there was a period a couple, a couple weeks ago where he was really focusing on, on Saul, on his conversion and the events immediately after his conversion in chapter 9. And then in chapters 10 and most of 11, he focuses away from Saul, um, but, but then Peter, right? And this is what we looked at last week. And the big focus last week within looking at Peter was the idea that the gospel, the, the, the good news about the person and work of Jesus, the gospel comes to a Gentile's home, comes to Cornelius' house, and we've got the Holy Spirit saving Gentiles, showing clear signs that he is doing a work amongst the Gentiles and integrating the Gentiles into the Christian community, which at that point was mostly Jewish, right, and, and, and Hellen, uh, Hellenist. And so that, that was amazing. That was last week. We saw God reveal his heart for all people, right, for the non-Jews. Um, and, and Peter and the Jewish believers, they're blown away at, uh, at, at how the Holy Spirit is revealing himself to these Gentiles. Game changer, right? Now today, in, in chapter 11, verses 19 through 30, um, Luke calls us to go back to the events that occur after Stephen stoning, okay? So that was, you know, several chapters ago. And if you remember, Stephen was the first martyr, and um, he was the first Christian that was killed for the sake of being a Christ follower. And Luke reminds us that after his death, many Christ followers were being persecuted, and they're scattering through nearby cities, towns, and villages, and, and going pretty far out. They're scattering like cockroaches when you turn on the light, okay? And these are Christians that are being persecuted. They're being forced to leave their families and their homes and their jobs. But what happens as a result, that as they're being scattered through the persecution, they're taking the gospel further and further away from Jerusalem. And so the gospel, the, the news about Jesus and what he did and why that's significant um, for everyone's uh, life to hear, it, it's spreading like a gospel, it's spreading like, 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 a, like a virus, okay? And Gentiles are responding to the faith. Verse 21 says that a great number of people are turning their hearts to the Lord. And so what does the Jerusalem church do as, as Antioch? Um, this new place is bubbling with, with revival, with the Holy Spirit doing a work. Um, the Jerusalem church, being like the center base of the early church, decides that they're going to send Barnabas, who's this well-respected leader within the church, to, to go 300 miles north from Jerusalem to Antioch to scope out the activity, okay? And this... Similar thing happened in Acts chapter 8, if you remember, when Philip took the gospel to the Samaritan villages. If you remember back then, the Jerusalem church sent Peter and John to see what was happening in the Samaritan churches. Um, so Barnabas, he makes this 300-mile trek 
to Antioch, and Antioch was a city that was known for its business. It was pretty close to the Mediterranean coast. It was known for its um, commerce and trade, but it was also known for its um, immorality. In fact, um, the Temple of Diana was not too far away, and so um, part of worship in, to the Temple of Diana was uh, a lot of um, sex. You know, there was um, uh, prostitutes within that temple that were dedicated to bringing worship to their goddess through through sex, through prostitution, basically, as an act of worship. But in this city that is filled with with immorality, many people, their hearts are turning towards God. And Barnabas gets there and he recognizes and affirms that God is certainly doing an amazing work and he ends up encouraging those disciples in Antioch to stay the course, to remain faithful to Jesus. And Barnabas realizes that, um, that, that Antioch is truly a strategic city for the advancement of the gospel. And so he decides to leave Antioch to go to Tarsus to go and get a guy named Saul, which we haven't heard from Saul for a couple chapters now. And Saul, he's been in Tarsus for quite some time. Barnabas brings Saul from Tarsus to Antioch. And we read that for one whole year, Saul and Barnabas, they commit themselves to this church community in Antioch. And they are teaching them sound doctrine. They're modeling to them what honoring Christ looks like. And they make that investment. And it's in Antioch we read that the label Christian is first given to Christ followers. Before this, you know, they were known as people of the way or just disciples um, or believers. But it's here in Antioch that the label Christian is first applied, probably in mocking fashion, actually, by the pagan worshipers of Antioch. And around this time, there's a, a guy named Agabus. And he's part of the Jerusalem church. And he's, he's, he's traveling from Jerusalem to the church in Antioch. And he's a prophet, we read. And the Holy Spirit gives him some type of insight that a global famine is coming. And so he tells the church in Antioch about this. And remember, this is predominantly Gentile believers. And verse 29 amazingly says, that the Antioch church determined, they committed, um, each and every one of them, it says, to send financial relief to their brothers and sisters in Judea, okay? Now, if you took the Foundation Bible Study class, uh, shameless plug right now, um, where is Judea, okay? It's uh, Southern Israel, the Southern region of Israel. It's not a city, it's a region. And that's where the Jerusalem church was. So this is Antioch, 300 miles north, sending financial relief out of concern of this upcoming you know, famine to where the home-based church was, the Jewish church was, okay? And this is so remarkable that Luke highlights it here. And it's such a amazing event that this Gentile church would do that for these Jewish believers 300 miles away. So amazing, so beautiful. And, you know, I'm sure that the Antioch church felt in some ways maybe indebted to the Jerusalem church. Um, the gospel came to them from the Jerusalem church. The Jerusalem church sent Barnabas and, and indirectly also sent Saul to, to further establish the, the church in Antioch in proper doctrine. And so when this famine was on the horizon, these newer believers, they chose to give back to the people that had already poured greatly into them um, finances to help alleviate the, the incoming famine. You know, quick comment about this. You know, one of the most beautiful acts of worship, um, one of the most sacrificial actions that shows love um, one of the ways to advance the kingdom of Jesus is through your financial giving to the home church. And, you know, right now, when I, when I talk about financial giving, I'm speaking directly to the Christians at the home church. If you're not a Christian at THC, uh, please do not give because this is part of an act of worship um, for us who are Christians and believers. Um, I'm talking to Christians and even more specifically 
to the covenant members of the home church, or maybe you plan on being a covenant member in the future, you know, there's something like 2,000 verses in the entire Bible that talk about money, and about half of them talk about stewarding money in a way that honors God. And to be completely honest with you, I've always been on the more reluctant side when it comes to talking about the importance of giving financially to the church, you know, your tithes and offering. Um, I think part of that is fear of what, my, uh, of what some of you might think if I, if I talk too much about money. Um, part of it is my own upbringing, upbringing that I had within the church that I had where that wasn't stressed too much. Um, and part of it also is wanting to avoid being painted in the same um, you know, way as some pastors and churches, which in my opinion, some pastors and churches uh, actually abuse this teaching and they overly pressure their members to give financially. And I just find it funny because last week, uh, last Sunday before church, I had a meeting with the finance team and I asked them the question, hey, do you guys think I talk about you know, finances enough from the pulpit? And all of them agreed um, unani- uh, you know, unanimously, like, yeah, you basically don't talk about it enough, Mitchell. Um, <laughs> like some of them said, yeah, we barely remember you ever addressing that from the pulpit. And then this passage comes up, which kind of gives me the ability to speak to it a little bit. And so, um, listen, for those of you who are Christians, those of you who are covenant members of the home church, Um, If you are committed to this church community, um, if you have financial means, if you have a job that pays you, then I want to challenge you in love to worship God and advance the kingdom of Jesus through your financial tithe and offering to our church. You are fueling the mission of Jesus through your money, okay? And I want to challenge you to give according to your ability, just like the church in Antioch does here. Um, um, Why? Okay, let's talk about this for a second. Why is it important to give? Well, one, um, there's the obedience issue, okay? Plainly said, like God tells us to, okay? Um, We see this pattern in the Old Testament. God told um, his covenant people, his chosen nation, Israel, to give financially through a tithe and also offerings as part of an act of worship, Um, And also as a way to pay for the operational cost of worship, you know, the priests, the temple, etc. And then in the New Testament, um, we know that Jesus allowed financial donations to be given to support his ministry. Did you know that? Um, We know this because Judas is referred to as the treasurer within, um, you know, that group between the apostles and Christ. And then here in the book of Acts several times we read about the generosity of the early church, that part of their love towards one another was was in giving of their financial, whether it was possessions in Acts chapter two or financial relief here in Acts chapter um, 12. Um, And then we look at Paul's letters when he's writing to churches. Half of the the letters that he wrote to churches talk about um, financial giving. And so for all these reasons, um, it's important that you know that um, financial, you know, offering is supporting the church community. It's supporting um, pastors and, and others on staff, and it's advancing the gospel and the kingdom. And so if you are a Christian at the home church and you're able to give, um, do so. You know, if you don't know how to or where to begin, I would encourage you to talk to your shepherds. Uh, you can talk to me as well. Um, but, but let that be an important expression of your worship and devotion to King Jesus and your love to this church community, okay? Quite simply, um, everything that you see take place in church, it, it takes money. Like, we pay rent to be in the building. Like, um, you guys pay me wage so that I can focus um, more diligently on pastoring this church. And, um, and, and, you know, and then you can also look at how our church is spending money through our budget that gets released to all the members. Um, so there's accountability there. But I just want to encourage you guys to to do that, you know, if you haven't already begun that. So moving on now, let's move on to chapter 12 now, which I encourage you to read fully on your own later. But let me summarize here. Uh, we have the news of James. 
one of the 12 OG apostles. Here in chapter 12, he's killed by the sword um, through the hands of evil Herod, okay? This is the first apostle to die since Jesus has ascended back to heaven. And then we read that Peter is arrested and Herod plans on killing him too. And the church begins to pray like crazy for Peter. And meanwhile, what Herod does is he amasses um, some soldiers and, 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 you know, he wants Peter to not escape, okay? <laughs> but then God, even though there's all these soldiers and even though he's in a prison, um, God miraculous, miraculously saves Peter through an angel. Peter was touched by an angel. And I already know that a lot of you don't understand that reference because you're too young, okay? <laughs> so let's talk about this. Um, and this is the main part that I want to talk about today in our passage. The title of the message was The Mission of the Kingdom. And I have three mysteries that I want us to really look at when we examine our text today. Here's the first mystery, okay? Um, sometimes God allows painful suffering to happen to good people for his good purpose. You know, it happens so fast. But when we read right now in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. So there's others that experienced this suffering as well. But Luke says, he highlights James in particular. It happened so fast, he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. You know, there isn't a lot of details here about, um, you know, what James might have said or how he might have felt and the direct impact this had on the church community. Luke just states it so matter-of-factly and it's interesting that Luke is more concerned in sharing this detailed story about Peter being miraculously broken out of jail by an angel. But let's go back for a second and understand the significance of the death of James, okay? Um, James, like I said, he's one of the OG apostles. He's the brother of John. Um, they, they came as a packaged duo, these two brothers, James and John. And he wasn't just an apostle, actually. We, we know from the Gospels that he was part of what we call the inner three. Um, amongst the 12 apostles, there was three apostles that Jesus spent even more time with, that Jesus gave additional teaching to. The inner three was Peter, James, and John. Um, it was this same uh, James that Jesus affectionately referred to as one of the sons of thunder. There's a story during Jesus' ministry where a particular town rejected the message of Jesus. And so James and John, as brothers, they go to Jesus and they say, Yo, Jesus, um, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to, to burn up all these suckers? Because how dare they reject you, okay? And from that moment on, Jesus referred to them as the sons of thunder. You know, Jesus was a jokester, by the way, okay? Um, um, it, was this, it was this same James that um, this following encounter took place during Jesus' ministry in Mark chapter 10. Uh, we read that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, remember they're brothers, they came to Jesus and they said to him, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. I, I mean, what a, what, a, what a way to start a conversation with Jesus, right? <laughs> okay. And, and Jesus says to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Okay. And by the way, this was mentioned in front of all of the um, other apostles. And we read at the very end that they get angry at, at this whole ordeal, at the audacity that James and John have to ask for this request. And keep in mind too that um, in their minds to sit at the right and left hand of the king showed that you were in positive favor of the king. And so they have already come to the place by this point to acknowledge Jesus is the Messiah King that has come to rescue and who has come to set up his kingdom. Okay. So they're thinking, Hey Jesus, I know there's 12 of us total, but how about the two of us? You know, we end up sitting on your right and left hand in your glory. Okay. In verse 38, Jesus says to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? 
or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. Wow. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. So in that moment, you know, they were so confident um, that they would be able to drink the cup of suffering, to be baptized in the baptism of suffering. And Jesus, Jesus actually was able to look into the future to this moment right here in Acts chapter 12, when James was actually ready to drink the cup of suffering and to be baptized or to be identified with suffering for the sake of God. And Acts chapter 12 verse two says that James was killed violently um, by the sword. Like what a terrible way to go. And most Bible scholars believe that James was in his 30s, so young. I mean, we don't read about this, but think about how his mom felt. You know, think about, uh, I, we don't know this, but perhaps he had wife, a, a wife and children. Think about how they must have felt that their husband, that their father, you know, was, was killed because of his devotion to Christ. Think about how the fellow apostles must have felt. Think about the whole early church. One of the apostles got killed. How devastating. And man, I, I think I get a little emotional thinking about how John must have felt, his brother, you know? The two of them were a package deal. They got called by Jesus together. They got trained by Jesus together. They launched the early church together, but now they're apart. And so this is the mystery that I want to talk about, the first one. Because doesn't it make sense for God to keep someone like James around so that the, the church can continue to grow? I mean, James is a top-notch kingdom-trained leader within the church. He's got influence. He's got knowledge. He's got experience. He's young. He's got a lot of years that he could put in to grow the church. Why take him? And here's what's crazy, because um, like I mentioned earlier, we already know that God has the power to intervene to save Peter, okay? Why not save James in this situation? Did, did, did God love Peter more than James? No. Church, listen, this is a mysterious thing in the kingdom of Jesus. Sometimes God allows deeply painful suffering to good people, godly people. And, and oftentimes we're left you know, saying, but God, don't you want your kingdom to advance? Don't you want people to be built up in the faith? Don't you want people to be saved? And you know, to be honest, there is no 100% completely satisfying answer to why God allows such suffering. I mean, of course, there's some things we know, like the fact that we live in a broken world with broken people, that sin has entered and fractured and brought about um, a separation between us and God. And we also know that there's a spiritual battle taking place. And in that spiritual battle, there can be suffering as a consequence of this spiritual realm that's going on. But you know, when you experience deep, deep suffering, the type that, that really shocks you to your core, um, there is no answers that guarantee automatic and instant comfort to like a truly aching soul. But here's what we do know. We can never accuse God. We can never accuse Jesus of not understanding what suffering feels like. Because Jesus was perfectly good and God allowed him the most painful suffering of all, all for the purpose of saving us. See, we don't have a fully satisfying answer for why this mystery exists, but we do have a Jesus who sympathizes with our suffering. We have a God that says, I love this world so much. I love my people so much. I will go down there to join them in their suffering and in their weakness and rescue them from the greater suffering that comes in the next life. See, in the early church 
and even in the present church, God often allows painful suffering. And some of it doesn't make sense on a human level. But we have to trust that he is good and we have to trust that he is somehow allowing this suffering to be purposeful. God doesn't waste our pain. He has a purpose and a plan for that pain. And that includes him being glorified. That includes his church advancing. That's the first mystery of the mission that just oftentimes doesn't make sense. Look at the second one with me. Sometimes God answers prayer quickly and dramatically. And sometimes God seems silent, but God is always working. So do you see what happens in Acts chapter 12, verse 3? You know, Herod, after killing James, probably feeling great about himself, probably feeling like he's in charge, um, he, he ends up capture, capturing the golden apostle, okay? The golden egg. Peter himself, the most vocal apostle of all. The one who preached at Pentecost. The one that was sent to Cornelius and, and, and started this movement amongst Gentiles. And so what does Herod do? Um, he places four Roman soldiers that have one job. Hey, your job is to only focus on Peter. And verse 6 tells us that two of these guards are chained to Peter even during his sleep. Okay? Now, verse 5 is important for us because it says that while Peter was kept in prison, earnest prayer, okay, passionate prayer, zealous prayer was made for him by the church. It was made to God by the church. So what happens um, after they pray is that Peter is rescued from certain death um, and these prayers activate a rescuing angel of the Lord to go into that prison and rescue Peter. And you could read the details about this miracle in verses 7 through 11. And it's interesting, man, Peter is sound asleep. I mean, that's pretty remarkable. Like if you know, like think about it, he already knows that James got killed by Herod. He gets captured by Herod, imprisoned by Herod, and Herod plans on killing him too. And he's able just to sleep knowing that he could die the very next day, right? Um, so that tells you a little bit about, about, uh, about Peter there. And then he's so tired too that the angel comes in brightly and that doesn't actually wake him up. It, it takes the angel like touching him, okay, for him to, to wake up. But what we see here is God has the ability to immediately rescue Peter. Did God have the ability to rescue James from being um, killed through his soul, by, by the sword? Yes. God had that ability, that, that ability to immediately rescue James. And I want you to see here as well that, that Peter isn't viewed in this passage as having exemplary faith necessarily, okay? We can't say that Peter was confident that he was going to be rescued. In fact, um, when the angel comes, it's not until verse 11, it's not until Peter is clearly out of the prison that he realizes that this wasn't a vision. He initially thinks like he's dreaming this whole scenario. So that tells us that he's surprised by his rescue. He wasn't expecting to be rescued. And we also can't say actually that, that, that this praying church uh, showed strong faith either because in verse 15, when, when the rescued, um, broken out of prison Peter shows up at the prayer meeting where they're praying for him to be rescued from prison, they actually don't believe Rhoda, the woman who is saying, hey, Peter's outside. He's trying to get in. Let's let him in. And they're like, you're crazy. Okay. So that, think about that. They're praying for him to get rescued. But even in their prayers, there's not this full assurance, um, confident belief that God would come through because when God did come through and rescue Peter, they don't believe it initially. This is a true mystery when it comes to how God works. Okay. Okay. So we can't pin it on Peter's faith. We can't pin it on the faith entirely of the, of the prayers. It's a mystery, you know. Um, but, but Peter gets rescued and James doesn't. You know, he, he, he answers the, the, the prayers from the church pretty quickly and pretty dramatically. But then I want to go back to something I breezed past earlier in chapter 11, which goes to this other part of this point, that sometimes God seems silent. 
Um, and we're in this season of waiting and we're seeking and seeking. And it seems like he's not working, but he is working. And in Acts chapter 11, verses 25 through 26, let's go back to the church of Antioch, which is exploding. And we read that Barnabas, um, this is when he goes to look for Saul. Okay. And then he finds him and he brings him back to Antioch. Now, you want to know something? Do you know how long Saul has been in Tarsus by the time Barnabas goes and gets him? Um, Remember, back in Acts chapter 9, Saul is saved dramatically, and we read about how immediately after his conversion, he gets baptized. Immediately after that, he becomes a radical preacher, okay? Uh, Let me read it to you, Acts chapter 9, verses 28 through 30. Uh, This is after his baptism. This is... um, uh, this is Saul, okay, or we also call him Paul. It says, so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord, okay? He goes from being a persecutor to a preacher. Um, and then verse 29, he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, these are the apostles and the, and the, the, the Jerusalem church, um, they brought him down to Caesarea and then they sent him off to Tarsus. Guys, you know how long Saul has been in Tarsus before Barnabas comes and gets him? You ready for this? I don't think you'll be able to guess this unless you knew this already. He's been there for 12 years. Did you know that? So, so, so get the story straight, okay? Jesus seeks out Saul dramatically. Vision, right? Damascus Road, blinding light that ends up blinding him, okay? Audibly calling um, calling down to him. Uh, why are you persecuting me? Paul Saul says, who am I persecuting? It's Jesus, okay? He gets saved. He tells the apostles, um, he, or he gets um, linked up to the apostles. Uh, Jesus tells Ananias that he has this plan for Saul that includes um, being that, that, saying that Saul is this chosen vessel to take the gospel to Gentiles, okay? And then Saul immediately jumps into the game, right? Gets baptized, and starts preaching like crazy. That's how, that's his personality. He's, he's, he's the guy on the, on the bench that doesn't like being on the bench. He's like, put me in the game, coach. He's one of those types of guys. But then we read here, um, <laughs> Well, we don't, we don't know this from this passage. We know this by linking up like Galatians chapter one um, and also putting together some other dates from the book of Acts. But we're able to infer that he's been waiting for 12 years. Um, and what a, what, a, what a lesson. I mean, can you imagine knowing what we know about Saul, Paul, so passionate about getting the gospel out. And... And he's been waiting for 12 years. I mean, he basically um, had to go through what David Pack's about to go through, like 10, 12 years of med school before becoming a doctor, okay? (laughs) Shout out to David Pack and your next uh, 12 years. But understand, you know, in that inactivity where he wasn't able to be on the front lines, Saul was exactly where he needed to be. And this is truly like a mystery when it comes to the kingdom of Jesus because You know, sometimes God answers prayers quickly and dramatically and powerfully and obviously. And and sometimes God seems rather silent and it's hard to detect um, his activity in our life. But understand, he is working. Listen, there's no formula to figure out how these things work, but this is how it works. The church in these 12 years is growing without Saul. The church is going through persecution, but it's growing. Um, Trials are come, people pray. Sometimes God answers those prayers miraculously. Sometimes he doesn't, but the church moves on. Listen, it, it may seem like God is working in clear, tangible ways in your life right now, and we rejoice with you. And that's awesome when you're able to detect God's activity in your life, but There's also seasons, sometimes very long seasons, that God seems rather quiet. And you're in the season of waiting. 
But friend, I want you to know that even in your waiting, God is always working. He's doing something in your life. He's building something within you or around you. He's refining you. He's working. He, trust him. Trust his plan. Trust his timing. Trust him. And, and be in um, united steps with God as he leads you. But yeah, what a, what a crazy trip when we understand that. Let's look at the third and final mystery that we see in this section. Third one is this, is that God is sovereign and our choices matter. And both of these things are completely true. See, this chapter, chapter 12, closes with the story about Herod, this powerful King Herod, um, who is struck down by an angel because of the pride that he has. He refuses to give God glory. And this is the same Herod that surely thought he was in charge and hated the Christian church. And he takes out the apostle James. And so I'm sure his confidence is growing and his view of himself and his authority and his reign. But then God, just like that, instantly removes him from his place of power because of his pride and arrogance. Just like that, God flickers his power. But then, you know, we obviously know that there are countless other kings and rulers and dictators and just evil people that God allows to continue to exist and God allows to continue to bring destruction and, and suffering. And we might even throw like the coronavirus in there, right? That God, he, he apparently has the power to put an end to suffering and to evil men, but sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. You know, this whole section is amazing to me and it really shows this mysterious relationship between God's power and our prayers, right? Um, and, and, and listen, at times God works powerfully through our prayers. In fact, one commentator said something I liked about Peter's um, miraculous uh, escape from prison by the angel. He, he said, the angel fetched Peter out of prison but prayer fetched the angel, okay? Um, but we also know um, that at times, you know, God works without our prayers. He works in spite of our lack of prayer. And this is, a, you know, one of the great mysteries within our mission. There's this mystery between the relationship between our work and God's work, you know? I find it even comical too that even when the angel frees Peter from prison, I don't know if you noticed it, um, the angel still told Peter to tie his shoes. Did you see that? It was kind of funny, like uh, put on your sandals because it's like he's able to get to, to, to get through all these guards and get him out of prison. But hey, Peter, you got to do your part still. Put on your sandals, okay? <laughs> and, and, and man, there's this idea too that, man, God's people, we are truly invincible, like nothing and no one can take our life unless God is done using us and God allows that and God decides that, okay? And in this section, we see God allows suffering to one of his devoted disciples and he offers salvation, you know, to another one of his devoted disciples. Why? Why one and not the other? I don't know, but that was his plan. That was his will. In the mission of Jesus, like, Scattering and persecution and trials can turn into growth of the church. In the mission of Jesus, one man can be touched by an angel and be freed, and the other man can be touched by an angel and, and die, right? What, what, what does all this mean? I want to, include, I want to conclude with a, a final thought. I want to read from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 9. God, through the prophet Isaiah, says, From my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Listen, our God is unpredictable. He has a flair for the dramatic. He likes a good story. He likes a good plot. The early church continued the mission despite all of these different oppositions, right? Verse 24 in Acts chapter 12 says, but the word of God increased 
and multiply. This was after Herod's death. This was after James's death as well. Listen, there is something liberating when you or I come to accept that Jesus has won and really allow that belief into the chambers of our emotions and our thoughts and our actions. Like there's something liberating when you or I come to realize that heaven has already been purchased for us, that the devil has already been defeated, that the church will advance and the gates of hell will not stop it, that God is truly in control at all times and at all times God is good. There's something liberating when we truly get it into our brain that God has a plan with all of our pain and with all global pain. When you or I come to that humble but liberating place to accept that God doesn't need me, that God can and will work without me, when you realize like I am in God's place, I am invincible unless he says I am not. Man, there is a peace that can wrap around your hearts and your minds that brings you true joy. Like THC, Jesus has won. Like, yeah, he died and he suffered, but remember, he rose again, okay? And, and for those of us who've experienced our own spiritual resurrections, being born again ourselves, as we've embraced Jesus as our Lord, as our Savior, as we've embraced his teaching as our authority, listen, Paul describes us this way. He says, we are more than conquerors in Christ. He could have said, we are conquerors in Christ, but he he uses the language to say we're actually greater than a victor, okay? We're more than conquerors in Christ. Um, it's like we go into a battle that's already been won, okay? And if you are able to accept that about your human existence, accept that all of your prayers and all of your plans, man, at the end of the day, they're written in pencil, okay? All of my effort, all of my thoughts written in pencil and just to come to that place of saying, God, I'm a pencil writer, but you've got the eraser and you've got the Sharpie pen, okay? Accept that God has editing ability over your life, over this world, and find the liberating freedom in that. Like experience the peace that comes with that. Like God's got you. So, so study hard for those midterms that you got this week, but also sleep well the night before you take those midterms because God's church is gonna advance and the victory will be had when it's all said and done. So, so what does this mean? So work hard for your boss, but sleep well knowing that God ain't gonna forget about you because God's church will advance and the victory will be had. This means pray hard, pray passionately, knowing that God will work with your prayers according to his will to accomplish the victory that he's already purchased, right? And so shake off your, your quarantine laziness and maybe your mediocre devotional life that's been exposed through this quarantine because I've got good news. Your devotional life doesn't determine the success or failure of Jesus's church winning. God's too strong for our weakness. And so Christian, the gospel allows us to live life from a position of joyful victory. Like we don't live for victory, we live from victory. And so go get that joy, go get that peace that's already been secured for you if you would just internalize and believe and allow these truths to really rest in your mind and in your heart, amen? And that is the mystery of the mission. Let's pray. Father, we don't fully understand your ways. But may this not be a reason to worry, but if anything, a reason to worship. Because we serve a big God who has a big plan that we can't always understand. God, help us to rest in your mission, um, in your mission work, because... It's ultimately you working with us, through us, in us, to us. God, help us to work hard for your mission because of the rest that you've secured for us. God, show yourself to be the big, powerful, 
sovereign God that you are to our small, weak, and fearful hearts. Because you are working your plan even in our suffering. You are working your plan even when you don't answer our prayers. You are working your plan even when you seem silent from our perspective. You are working your plan through our commitment to your mission. You are working your plan through our prayers. You are working your plan through our financial offering. So God, let us work hard for your kingdom, even in the mystery, and from a place of peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we'll have a time of the giving of our tithes and offerings. Uh, we here at the Home Church believe that the giving of our tithes and offerings is the joyful responsibility of our Covenant Church members. So if you're just tuning in for the first time or um, if you're a seeker of Christianity, please don't feel obligated to give. Um, but for those who uh, are willing to give and would like to, you can find that on the on our the Home Church app, or if you're on your computer or your laptop, um, you can find it at thehomechurchrolling.com. On the top right hand corner, there's a tab for giving. Yeah.
conclusion of the service but right now it's friday at 4 30 but we're going to pretend like this is happening live because we have a special announcement to make georgia fc which is shepherded by chad and eileen um, they have decided that it is time for their family church to multiply and we've got daniel and esther with us and cutie little hunter and um you know in the past multiplications we've had the the more veteran shepherds pray over the new shepherds and i really wanted this to still take place uh, virtually so we're really excited um as a church we are now going from eight family churches to nine and um of course this isn't technically a official multiplication yet because once the quarantine period ends they're going to all get together 
and they're going to talk about whether they're going to reabsorb or stay multiplied. But church, this is a, a great reminder of the purpose of what we're doing on Fridays. And even though we're in this quarantine, may this not halt our mission of reaching the lost and making disciples. So I'm going to ask all of you guys right now as you're watching this to extend your hand towards the screen. And I'm going to ask Eileen to pray for Esther and for Chad to pray for Daniel. Go ahead, Eileen. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, I just thank you so much for my sister Esther, Lord, um, and just the heart of hospitality that you've given her, Lord. And um, I just pray uh, during this time as um, she and Dealey um, multiply, um, that you would uh, lead her, that you would guide her, Lord, that you would reveal more of yourself to her, um, that you would draw her closer to you, Lord. And um, that you would, um, increase her joy and, and her love, um, as she reaches out to others, Lord, um, would you, um, continue to strengthen her, um, as a mom, Lord, um, and as a wife, and, um, I just pray that, um, yeah, that during this time, Father, as she's, uh, presented, uh, with greater opportunities to love, Lord, um, that you would grow her love and her compassion for others, Lord, and um, and in the midst of that, Lord, that she would discover more of your love for her as well. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God, I pray for Daniel, Lord. I just, uh, thank you for this brother in Christ, Lord. I just thank you for his dedication he's shown. I just thank you for his willingness. To, um, to answer your call, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to be with them during this time, Lord, that you would just give them guidance and wisdom in leading this new FC, Lord. Um, again, I just want to celebrate this new FC, Lord, and I'm just very excited to have Daniel and Esther lead this group, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to just expand their capacity to love, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to just show them what that word love means, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that they would, uh, whenever they feel in doubt, Lord, that they would just reach out, Lord, and just remember to pray and just remember that you are there with them, Lord, that no one is perfect, Lord. All, I, all that you ask, Lord, is a willing heart, Lord, and I see that very strongly in Daniel, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to grow him as a person, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would just bring joy to his group, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that all his actions um, would just continue to honor you like they have in the past, Lord. Can you pray? Amen. 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 Well, everybody that's watching, put lots of hand clapping emojis to celebrate. And then we're going to close this off with, with Hunter just looking cute. <laughs>